What's going on, coaches? How are you doing? Hey, real quick, before we get into it, I got the man, the myth, the legend, Coach T-Mac. We're going to be talking about uh, deep choice and all that. He's going to spill the tea on everything. I'm just kidding. He's looking at me like I'm crazy. Uh, I've got to thank today's sponsor, uh, Throw Deep Publishing. I'm going to read it. I know I sound like I'm illiterate. Please forgive me real quick. Give me these 10 seconds. Uh, first off, I want to thank Throw Deep Publishing for sponsoring this episode. Check out the brand new release, 101 Plays from the Oklahoma Offense, available now from Throw Deep Publishing. 101 Plays from Oklahoma offense. Is it easy to understand? Listen, I, I, Alex, I love you. It's a great book. Check it out, man. Seriously, it is unbelievable. He dived deep into it. He freaking outdid himself. If you go at the link at the bottom or just go to uh, throw the football secrets.com slash throw deep, you spread 20, you get 20% off. It's a freaking unbelievable book. Get yourself that. And now without further ado, coming back in the frame, we got coach T Mac Travis, man. How you doing, sir? Man, I'm living the dream. We're getting we're getting close to real football season, so I'm on cloud nine. Yes, we are. Not only that, got a new one coming. Uh, an, another child on the way. So you you decided to go through post COVID. I guess we can say it's post COVID. I really don't know what's going yeah, on right, right now. But the the season after COVID on hard mode with a, a new child and going through a whole. Are y'all doing like the whole season as like 13, 14 weeks or however Texas does down there? Yeah, so we'll uh, we're back to our normal schedule. We got um, we'll go to we'll go our inner squad like meet the Bobcats two scrimmages, and then we got a full ten before the playoffs. So yeah, man, that is awesome. I'm I'm thrilled. I know you are as well. How did it go last year? Because I know last year you were a first time OC, and you went through it during COVID. <laughs> what? what were you able to do everything? Because I know we talked last year about the things you wanted to implement. Were you able to implement everything you wanted or did the shortened season kind of make you hold some things back and you're now putting them in? Um, yes and no. Uh, I went in with, you know, just the wide-eyed innocence and full confidence of like, oh, we're going to make this work. They, I mean, the kids were fully bought in, worked their tails off, everything that they could do with restrictions and what what situation we were in they did um and so we i came into two days the first scrimmage with the with the mindset of like we're right where we need to be um lo and behold you know spring ball reps seven on seven and a full summer that's a really valuable thing and those reps really do matter um and so we had a we had a little bit of a gut check i thought you know i thought we were level three, four going into that week one. And we were still kind of hanging around level one, two. Um, so there were some growing pains and um, a little trial by fire, but by the end of the season, we found who we were. We had an, we had a true identity and um, we were able to do a lot of what I wanted, not everything, but that ended up being more because of those couple things didn't fit our personnel, not because we didn't have time to do it or the kids didn't understand it. It just, you know, if buck sweeps a better play than inside zone for your kids, then, you know, why run inside zone? I agree. I agree. Okay. So I want to come to that. Cause you said something that I like uh, coaches. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here. If you like this, if it sounds good, everything like that, just go ahead and hit that thumbs up. I really, uh, YouTube likes it. It gives us that stuff, gets it out there so that everyone can know how to run deep choice. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in. <laughs> put them in the chat. We will answer to them. You said though, I want to get to uh, your identity. Now, was that the identity that your t your team finally got? Was that something that you wanted for them, or was it another identity that they came around to, like you're saying, Buck Sweep, or something like that? And you're like, you know what? This is what they like. I'm going to go this way. Uh, it was a little bit of both. Um, you know, my background and and my coaching tree downhill running as far as the run game goes downhill a gap to a gap is is really where we want to live we want it to be as vertical as possible with the ball in our hands um and then passing the ball i love using all 53 and a third um and i love to take shots and i knew that innately we had the kids that could do those things it was just tweaking and creating the environment to where they felt comfortable within concepts, schemes and, and plays that we had in place. So um, it's a, I know that's a really gray, vague answer, but, yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> but yes and no. Okay. Um, 
did you change anything? Like you, you were the new offensive coordinator. Was there anything from the previous coordinator that you kept, or do, when you came in, you're like, you know what? I'll no disrespect to that old offensive coordinator, but I really didn't like what he was doing. I want to do this. This is what we're going to do. Um, I kept, I kept a little bit. There was so Salina has a pretty storied tradition as far as state championship success, and a lot of that came in the full house backfield. And so one of the first conversations I had with the head coach, he said, you know, do whatever you want. This is your offense. All I ask is we keep, you know, a little wrinkle, a full house wrinkle to where at the end of the day, he said, I think it's really cool for the kids to see that to, you know, old alumni to see that. And he said, and I think it's really good football. And really there's not much difference from that than any 21 or 12 personnel right guys line up in the different spot but you're still getting two lead blockers and you're or you're still getting a misdirection with one lead blocker either way so doing that was really true to kind of what we had been and then the verbiage kept kept a little of the like personnel communication the same but then after that a lot of that came i felt like i really wanted to bring my own identity into how we were going to throw the ball and how we were going to call certain plays and things of that nature, just because my, the way my football brain works and the way the former OC's football brain works, they're, they're not the same. And that's probably because of, you know, I have a very rudimentary football knowledge as far as it's been pretty consistent in everything that I've retained. So when I think of power, I think of it as I think of the run game and numbers and I think of the passing game in words. And he was a little bit flipped from that. And so that was probably the biggest change. But other than that, I mean, I tried to keep it, especially with it being COVID, I tried to keep a lot of things, keep the same things in that we could where it wasn't going to confuse me. <laughs> no, I like that. Because at, at, at the end of the day, the, the kids will know as much as you. And if you're confused as the coach, the kids are going to be like, triple confused exactly so i i do like that um you don't have to tell us i know i'm, I'm giving I'm, I'm busting your your balls here about deep choice but i do know it's not a true progression kinda as w what we talk about the air raid progressions right did y'all do that last year and the reason why i'm asking or before you got there and the reason why i'm asking is how long was it if you didn't did the quarterback feel comfortable with that type of throwing that you finally saw the explosive plays that I know you're accustomed to? Um, we did a little bit of it. Um, my quarterback coach now played at Salina, Stad's a head coach, four-year starter, went to North Carolina. So let's Seth Luttrell, Fedora, Keith Heckendorf, those, all of those offensive minds really molded his football IQ at the collegiate level. And they were doing some some choice type stuff off of 90 and off of some other things, you know, their cross had a couple different option things. So guys were used to running okay. on the fly, making decisions. Um, but it was a little different um, from what they were used to in, in 19 and 18 that we had done, but it wasn't exactly the same. So there was a little bit of a learning curve, um, you know, game one quarterback, anticipated or kind of assumed and it led to an interception and I made the immediate reaction of like our quarterback would never do that so I started yelling at the receiver and then the quarterback kind of laid his cards on the table and was like well I just thought and I said that's not your job your job's not to think on when we call this play your job's not to think I'll have you think other plays not this one gotcha and was was he taken aback by that like what that I I thought I had to think out there. That's that's a quarterback's job. Yeah, that was it was a little bit of a turning point in our in our relationship of just well, what do you mean? Well, I mean that when I tell you that I want you to just react, that's what I mean. There's no this is this is the most elementary play that we're gonna have, and we can't try and overcomplicate it. <laughs> Which I love, by the way. And uh coaches, again, thank you so much for being here. I, I see y'all, we're talking to you. So we're gonna be talking about tempo. I know. Uh, coach, you were a huge tempo guy, or at least you were when you played at Baylor because that's the only thing that I got to ask. I, I can't remember if I asked you this or not. Who was faster? Was it Art Browse Baylor or Chip Kelly, uh, Oregon? Do you think it was us? Hands okay. down. Why do you say that? Because 
I think, you know, foundationally, I think the biggest reason it was us is because I think we practice faster. And I'm saying that from obviously a one-sided perspective. I never attended an Oregon practice, never went through it, but we did have a transfer from Oregon, Lake Seastrunk, who okay. set out my seat, my fifth year, he set out um, because of the transfer rule, the, the former transfer rule. And through brief conversations with him, it, it was just, it was different. Um, I mean, to the point where like our, our midpoint of practice, when we go on break, it was like mandatory you know, coach Kaz and, and the strength staff would run around and like yell at you if you weren't sitting down or on a knee. Oh, wow. They would yell at you if you didn't have, you know, at the time we were still under a really bad contract and sponsored by all sport. But if you didn't have an all sport in your hand or a water, then you were probably getting yelled at. And it was because the hydration and, and the fueling with nutrition through like a power bar or something was so vital to go run that last hour, 10 minutes of practice. It just little things like that. And then watching, the way our a lot of our tempo and playing fast came in explosive plays. And in 2011, we come out in the first game and had, you know, four touchdowns over 45 yards. So it's just, it's different. And I know that you could give the ball to Black Mamba and he could change directions like six times and break eight tackles and score a touchdown. I just felt like if you just line up and run past people, then you probably play a little faster. Yeah, yeah I agree. And I, I agree with you as well that I thought Baylor played a lot faster because it didn't seem – Coach Kelly looked a little bit more gimmicky, like he had those gimmick-type plays, and y'all just looked like you just lined up and put the fastest guys out there and then was just like, peace, you can't catch us. Uh, we'll see you later. So that's awesome. And the reason why I bring that up, I want to talk about tempo. But first, we got coaches. Uh, Pat says fast tempo is overrated, but from a flex bone guy who loves to burn the last six minutes of the game to get the win, no tempo – uh, controlling game flow is not overrated. Do you do that? I know you did some, some stuff. Do y'all have like a four minute offense where you kind um, of blow things up a little bit? Yeah, we don't. I know like uh, our quarterbacks coach when he was at North Carolina, they would they would red, yellow, green mm -hmm. uh, for for tempos. And we don't have any like stated call like tags or anything of that nature. We'll just start a drive. And I'm really, really fortunate. We got a a, a dude at quarterback and before we start a drive, just kind of communicate with him. Hey, we're at 10, we're at six, we're at four, whatever it is. Um, and he does a really good job of, of making sure we don't hold the offensive line in their stances too long. And so it's more of just me and him get on the same page. And then once I call play, just let him run the show. I've been, we've, we've been in situations where it was like, okay, don't signal the play until we get to a certain time because it's going to do, you know, the quarterbacks automatically kind of just go into quarterback mode yeah. and having the, the ability to not have to worry about that with, with the kid we have now, it, it makes my job a lot easier because we don't have to focus on having altered tempo sections of practice. We can just practice fast. And then when we get out there, we'll play as fast as we need to. Okay. Uh why did you go away from or what made you decide to play with the different types of tempo? Because I know at Baylor, you you were what uh, on the gas the whole time. Did you decide to break up tempo this year just because of COVID or was that something you had going in like, hey, we're going to have different speeds? What was your thought process? Uh, a lot of it had to do with the failures early on in the season and running ninety mean? plays. week one. We run 90 plus plays and lose, <laughs> you know, and my DC's like. Hey, uh, did you know that 18 possessions in a game is bad for us? It's like, well, it's good for us, but I get your point. Um, and getting caught up in lots of plays, lots of plays, lots of plays, and not focusing on the other side of the analytics of a lot of positive plays. And so trying to find that balance and doing a better job of communicating with the defensive side, understanding our opponent. Second round of the playoffs, we go up against a team that it was the only legit 4-4 kid that we had seen all year. Like, if you put him on a laser right now, he's 4-4. I don't care who he's running against, who he's running with. And we we knew that they could score. They had similar offensive style. They could score at the drop of a hat. And so then it became, our tempo became, how can we keep them off the field? We win a two-possession game, but they scored 21 points on 38 plays. So situations like that you start trying you start figuring out tempo is really important 
if you can control different versions of it. There's lots of plays tempo, there's time of possession tempo, and there's that control your opponent tempo. And so we wanted to make sure that we could do any version that we needed to that was going to help our defense, help our special teams. You know, the couple two-way players we had, it was going to be able to help them. How do you practice that? Like, do you go into a game and you're like, okay, guys, this week we're going to go really slow. So we're going to have to play that way and practice that way. Are you still practicing as fast as you can? And then, like you said, you're just holding off on what you're going to call on the sideline or telling your quarterback, hey, don't signal anything in this week until it's 10 seconds left or something like that. Yeah, it was more of that. We would uh, we still practice as fast as we could because especially with us being a smaller school, we're split practice. I'm only getting 42 minutes, so I got to get every rep on tape that I can. And then those games that we knew that that was the case, like going into that second round game, we knew that that was our, our approach from the opening whistle to the end of the fourth. So, hey, guys, we're practicing as fast as we can. But remember, the, the goal on Friday is going to be control the ball, keep their offense off the field. So we got to be vertical. We got to finish plays. And you got to get lined up, but we're going to do a great job of controlling the clock and just verbalizing that that expectation so we didn't have to alter our practice schedule. Okay. I like that. And, Coach, we have some uh, questions right now. Uh, Johnny is still waiting for your kick return video. Oh, hate hey. to see it. Yeah. Tell him, Johnny, send, send me a DM, and I'll send you the rough copy. On I'll Google uh, Drive it to you. There you go. This is this is one of my my guys. Uh, he coaches in Texas, man. And you you should you should be getting some sleep and getting ready to get to practice tomorrow, buddy. So don't stay up all night playing Madden. All right. Uh, William wants to know, Coach T Mac, how do you name play calls and do you like using tags to modify your calls? So you said that you were numbers for the runs and words for the passes, correct? Yes. Okay. So why? Like um, what? And the reason why I ask is because I'm like the complete opposite. I'm really dumb when it comes to numbers. I like got a form of dyslexia and I'm a math teacher. So sorry, kids, for that. And I sometimes would get confused with the numbers. I just know the words. Why do you do it that way? Um, from a run game standpoint, I still vividly remember being, you know, Pee Wee football, uh, the Brazos Valley League. And they line us up that first day and they're like, okay, odds are on the left, evens are on the right. So the run game's always been associated to to numbers for me. Um, and then from a word standpoint for the passing game, um, it seemed for me, it seems to be the easiest as far as communicating with new coaches or talking schemes with other guys. Because when you look at cross, I know like cross is one of my favorite plays. And if you say cross, the vast majority of coaches you talk to is going to, they're going to know what you mean. Some of them know it as 95. Some of them know it as something else. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. The other part of that is kind of leads to the second part of your question. I'm a big tag guy in the form of who, like I'll tell specific guys who I want to do specific things. Who do we want to run the cross? Do we want to tag something else off of that? Um, and as long as the the tag doesn't become, you know, a mouthful and we're not just signaling for 15 seconds to call one play. Um, I think it's, I think it helps the kids and I try and keep our passing game as simple as possible and not have 14, 15 different concepts. We can all get to the same place as long as I can teach those five or six foundational pieces and then tag something. So if I want to run, you know, a, a double move off of like a Z spot. Well, we have a way to do that. But as long as I teach Z spot foundationally, well, Z knows what he's doing. And so the ripple effect off of that, it's just been the easiest way for my brain to work. Um, now in a perfect world, I would like to get kind of back to where I was at Baylor, where they're both number based. Um, but I'm not super confident in myself I would know what I want to do, but I'm not super confident in myself in teaching the kids to do it that way, to understand it that way. So for now, I'm going to do it in the way that I feel the most confident in communicating. Why do you think you can't you can't teach it that way? Since you since you were in that system and that's kind of what you based your entire 
offensive philosophy off of? The biggest reason is because I haven't, I haven't taught it. I gotcha. played it. I did it. But when I got into coaching, nobody else, nobody else called it that way. Nobody else talked that way. So I was too, I was spending a lot of time learning how to communicate in these new languages where I didn't forget my first language, but my communication teaching and with it being with last year being in COVID, I didn't want to full scale change gotcha. absolutely everything. And now we're in such a good spot with our momentum and the guys we got coming back that it would almost, it would be like creating adversity just for adversity's sake. It would be detrimental because now they know it and you're like, Hey guys, you know it. Right. But F that we're going to go back to this way because I want to do it. Yeah. Okay. I I totally understand you. Good question, man. Um, I have to ask, this is me personally. Have you found yourself with the play call too long? Like you have, you do you do the typical like formation play tag? Yes. Okay. Have you ever found yourself like with a mouthful play? And if you have, what do you do to combat that? Because I do sometimes I'm calling plays and after it's over with, I look to my to the wide receiver coach, Coach Print, shout out, love you, buddy. And I go, dude, we're the fucking West Coast now, man. I just said a, I just said a paragraph. I need to I need to work on that. Um, so kind of my personal rule is formation formation motion play tag and anything more than that needs to be a new play okay if i if i get too deep into like i don't i don't ever want to be a multi-tag guy i want if we're tagging something i want to be able to give a tag because that tag is going to change obviously the quarterback's mindset his eye progression all of that so if i start to start throwing out two or three we'll just tag either find a way to one tag it or you need to go back to the drawing board, put a new concept in that creates what you're trying to get to. I like that. And I'm probably going to do that because I find myself on a formation, then a tag to the formation and then a motion from that and then a play and then a tag to that play. And I really, I, I just get my sheet out and I'm like, nah, that, that's, that's, that's too much. I need to do that. So I need to tie that back into just like a one word thing. And this is the motion. This is the play. This is everything. I got to do what coach T Mac does. Cause he's, man all right we got some more questions let's see where we have uh here we go coach edward says i have a lot of players playing high school and or tackle football for the first time is playing fast asking a lot of the new guys what do you think coach yes i do i think personally it's if you're taking a bunch of guys who are still learning the foundational pieces of of how to play the game then i would focus on technique concept first you're going to you're probably going to be an offense that's running, you know, 40 to 45 plays a game and that's okay because if those guys are getting really good at the fundamentals and and laying a strong foundation, well, you never know by your bye week, by week 6, they could be looking at you saying, "Hey, we're ready for more." And now you can start to amp up the tempo. For me, tempo is something that is if you understand it and you communicate it to your kids in a way that they understand it, you can always turn it up or turn it down. But if you try and, you know, it's just like anything with us, like I'll never forget my first year teaching. They were like, all right, here's, here's your teaching mentor, you know, just do right by the kids. And it was, you know, you're just a deer in the headlights checking over your shoulder every 30 seconds. Um, And so I, if it was me and I, if I was in that situation, I would be, really really focused on making sure that we're getting the best out of each rep we're laying a strong foundation and then let the success dictate if we turn the tempo up what what success do you need like is there a threshold of success before you you would be like okay let's 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 go fast and if that is how are you going fast are you suddenly making one word plays are you just turning up the tempo and like doing those drills going faster what would you do um I would I would probably set a like a a positive play threshold, you know, of 70, 75, 80%, whatever, you know, the staff kind of agrees, hey, if we reach this point, these guys, these guys got it. And then from there, the first thing that I would do would just be um be intentional in our coaches' urgency to increase practice tempo. You know, the the personality not the personality but the the communication and the demeanor of a coach can 
amplify practice tempo and effort faster than a lot of people realize. So that's for me kind of the easiest way. And then from there, you just continue to emphasize that through your communication. Hey guys, you, you guys are knocking this out. You've, you know, you've mastered the playbook. So now we want to master the master the playbook at full speed. I like it. I like it. Speaking of practice and tempo, do you have some tips on how to go faster? Cause I'm always looking for ways to get efficient and practice and everything. And I know you come from that tree where, I mean, it was, it was a weld on machine mm-hmm. at, at Baylor. What are some things that you've taken practice wise from there and you transferred it over to where you're at now? Um, one of the biggest things is from a skill position standpoint, we try and spread out because mm-hmm. as far as like, say we're in a team period, mm-hmm. You know, where what's the what's the natural inclination of of a, of an offensive staff during team? Well, to stand behind the ball, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what I try and do is day to day through practice, I try and bounce back and forth from side, you know, one day I'll call on the left sideline and next day I'll call on the right sideline. Um, and then from there, the quarterback's coach, he'll line up, you know, in different spots to help communicate. And the running back's coach will, you know, he might be spotting the ball, but then stay, he's standing right behind the same linebacker so he can communicate. And really the only guy that doesn't move is our line coach because he's got to see all five and he's a head coach. So we've got a receipt. We've got me on one side, the other receivers coach on the other side, and we've all kind of divided and conquered. And so the biggest thing we do there is I'll spend a lot of, I'll front load a lot of time making sure guys know the signals. Um, and that way, if they happen to be jogging back or stepping in to fill in for a guy and they miss one, well, they're just going to turn and look and they're either their teammates going to communicate to them or we're going to communicate to them and let them know the play. And that right there, that's going to increase your efficiency immediately just because guys aren't having to do this or, you know, put their hands in the air. There's a skill coach within eight yards of everybody and they can say, Hey, do this. Hey, this play, Hey, you got this. So. I like that. I like that. Now, do you, are you the one that signals? Do you stay in the box? And the reason why is like if they're doing that and you have everybody spaced out and they can just turn and look, how do you train them to what to look for during the game? Because that's the one thing like I'm always on the same spot trying to train them for the game where to find. But you're doing something different, which allows you to get a lot more reps and cuts down the confusion. But how does that carry over to the game? So I, I, I'm on the sideline. And I signal I two years before I was in the box and. It's hundred percent true. You can see a, a lot up there. Um, but as I've talked with my buddy TK about, we are both, you know, the analytics and the scouting report are huge parts, but at the end of the day, there's a, there's a feel aspect that we're huge believers in and, and being on the field and being the one to signal um, is something that I'm a firm believer in. Now, as I mentioned to you, um, it's when there's only one guy doing everything, it's really easy for opponents to scout you. So we are going to, we're going to mix in some other guys in those roles, but all that'll mean is I'll, I'll fill in for them. I'll switch places with them. So if the receivers coach is going to signal, well, I'll go to the opposite sideline and help communicate. And if the running backs coach is going to signal, well, I'll go stand where he was standing and help communicate. So that's kind of our easiest fix for that is to just if whoever's going to signal that day is going to be where I normally stand and I'll go fill in for them that way the kids don't lose that echo okay I have to ask Matt do you tape your fingers up like Kendall did I do not so uh, I tried it um my boy, <laughs> Tate, my boy Tatum tapes his fingers and uh and Tate Wallace tapes his fingers too and I tried it our first scrimmage and it just I don't I didn't do it right like I, I tore the pieces too fat and it was limiting my ability to like bend my fingers, but then it just got in my head and I was like, you know what? I'm over this. And your did your fingers turn blue? You did it too tight and you're just a like little, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> a couple of them had, they had a purple tinge to them. <laughs> All right. Great stuff, man. All right. Uh, Tyler wants to know, are you a believer in if then installs? I'm a huge believer in if then rules. I don't know about installs. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that like our entire install is built around an if then principle, but I think if then rules are easy, straightforward applications to foundational plays that just immediately give you answers. And they're not always like to me. an if then rule is, is not your traditional of 
pre-snap always has to be an if then hey guys this is how we do this play but if my box guy sees i'm doing this then we've got this change up to the same play we can still run power right but i'll call it this way i'll tag it this way so we can get them into the look that we like so i've never I've never built a, a full beginning to end if then install, but I'm a huge believer in if then rules as far as answers to opponents. I think it's the easiest way to explain those those in game adjustments that you have to you have to make. I just uh, I like that answer. I completely agree with it. I just think the wing T is just taking over, and it really it, it upsets me, man. It upsets me. I know how much you like them though. Uh, Cleveland wants to know how many run schemes do you carry and how many do you marry them to your past schemes? I think I said, um, that. so that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, because you could look at our run game and be like, Oh my gosh, he carries like 11. But for us, I truly feel like we try and carry five. Um, and that's ISO zone power buck sweep. And then our Salina traditional full house stuff, uh, which is kind of a, a mesh of, of ISO and zone. Um, but we do each of those a couple different ways. But for me, when I look at like building a run game, I'm looking at it. How many different things does the offensive line have to learn? To me, the skill guys, because I can tag and I can tell them to do certain things, their job is easier. And the offensive line that's five 300 pound dudes, 250 pound dudes that have to work as one. So I want their thought process communication wise to be as easy as possible. So if we only have five, six line calls or communications from our quarterback to our offensive line, then I only consider those six concepts. Um, and then we try to, we try to marry, um, we try to marry some of our passing game and it could be the same play cross could be married to power and it could be married to buck sweep. Right. We try and marry um, most of them to at least one passing game concept just for play action abilities. We see a lot of, we see a lot of man free, uh, a lot of press man when we get deeper into the season. Yes. Um, which, Hey, I get it. You know, you're going to, you got to make us do one thing, right. You're gonna if you're not gonna let us run the ball, then you're saying you got to be able to beat man coverage. So, I I understand the thought process, but with I that being said, said, you know we try and make certain things look. We try and make our passing game look as similar as we can to our run game to eliminate the ability for guys to really spin and rotate on us. Dang, I still can't. Yeah, I've seen your guys. I would not at all go man to man against y'all unless the other teams got dudes but obviously didn't because you kind of went kind of far this year so no um randall says i, I think tempo is misunderstood i want to know do you think it do you think tempo is misunderstood or that tempo has like the super fast tempo has it worn out it's welcome and defenses now know it or do you think it's just because coaches now have gotten lazy on how to use it and it's it's kind of like going by the wayside I think I think Randall's on to something, but I think that it's a lot of it is the evolution. So I think tempo is misunderstood because it's become like a an offensive buzzword. It's air raid, it's tempo, right? It's those things that guys hear and they want to do, but it's something that you have to understand. You have to understand the why behind it. And the other part and the I think is the bigger part, the evolution of tempo is is something that's so critical because, you know, defensive coaches are smart too. You know, there's a strong Perfectly. argument that they might be, they might be a little bit smarter just because they have to, they have to plan for what you might do, not what you're going to do. Cause they don't know. Um, but being able to combat straight tempo. I mean, I've uh, the past couple of weeks, I've been going back watching some 2014, 2015 uh, Baylor film and seeing, <laughs> seeing how many times, the same play is run over and over and over and they go to Oklahoma state with a third string quarterback and they still catch them, you know, in like a full sub change and get 12 men on the field for a free play. And that was, I mean, that's six years ago, almost, almost seven seasons ago. So it's, it's evolved so much in that time that it's not just go, 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 go. You're, you have to have 
an intent. You have to have a purpose and you have to understand that defensive coaches have been seeing that for, you know, seven, eight, nine years, they're going to have answers. So if you're just going and that's, and that's what got me the first few weeks going out there, just trying to run as many places as you can and do it really fast. We'll go three and out tr- twice. Do that. Run 33 seconds off the clock in two possessions. And you and your DC will be coming to fisticuffs real soon. Exactly. I do. I think that's a pitfall. A lot of coaches do fall into. I know I have when I, when I did it first thing, it's like we're, we're taught or everyone's told if you go fast, defenses don't know what the hell to do. And sometimes you can, but then there is that other side of the coin where, like you said, you have two or three, three and outs. And the next thing, you know, you're down 14, nothing or 21 to nothing. Cause the, the other uh, uh, team capitalizes on it. And then all of a sudden your butthole gets really tight and you're like, Oh shit, maybe we shouldn't go that fast. And to me, that's also a disservice because you've been practicing going fast all this time. Now you're behind. And instead of going fast again, you kind of pull it back. And I, I, I believe the kids feel that like, Oh, coach is not, is not really invested in this. Did y'all have that at Baylor? Like get down fast and did anything change or were they just like, man, screw this. This is what we're doing. We're either going to beat a team 100 or nothing or get beat 100 or nothing. Um, you know, if my mem, you don't remember, right, those conversations that you may not have actually been privy to. So in in my best recollection, we were who we were. Oh, you're, but, sk- you're um, skirting it. You're skirting it. But It's so, lawyer speak. But, <laughs> but so much of that was predicated on the fact that our tempo was – was tailored to the confidence and the game plan of the coaches, right? If you go and you, I mean, you look at the tree now, you see it to this day, you go out and yeah, your first series may go three and out and you may only take 22 seconds off the clock. Okay. But it was a drop. Your pulling guard fell down. Right. And then you're in third and long. Right. But, but that doesn't mean that was a successful play schematically. We just have to clean up our execution. And until the pitfalls, snowball and build up we're not going to change who we are and i think that's the biggest thing is we went fast because we were built to go fast and our game plan was built with such confidence that we were just going to go do it and we knew it was going to work obviously it doesn't work every saturday but the answer isn't to abandon your your game plan if your game plan is built to the depths of which i believe coach browse and the staff did if you if you're the bulk of your game plan is we're just going to play fast and wear them out. Okay. But why, what is it that you see that's going to allow you to stay in the same formation for the entire first drive? What is it that you see that's going to allow you to run power to the left six times in a row? What is it that you're seeing? And if you can't answer those questions, then you're just being fast for, for fast sake. And that's where you're going to get into that two, three possession flip really fast. So what I'm paraphrasing here is you got to know the why. For mm-hmm. going fast, you yeah. can't just be like, "Oh shit, I like going fast. We're going to go fast." Hundred percent. Do you okay on the flip side? Because I'm from little old South Carolina. You know, I'm not in the big leagues like okay. Texas and the entire football Twitter universe was down at the the convention. What? I told, hey, we t- me and my buddy TK, we actually talked about it today. I told you about it. I know. I, I wanted to come, man, but I mean. Y'all do some. Y'all are in the middle. Of, I'm still coaching football, and y'all are just okay. Texas. Just like f it, man. I'm convention time. Everybody and their brother, come on down here and let's get everyone <laughs> down there. I, seriously, dude, was everybody down there? Uh, so the so Saban, Nick Saban, did the general meeting to open the convention with John Gordon of uh, you know, training camp, the energy bus. And then the Division One coaches panel had um, Lincoln Riley, Sarkeesian, Fisher, Jeff Trailer at UTSA, um, and then from a coach's Twitter standpoint, Marco show he came back down from from Washington State, uh, made an appearance. Caduti was you know holding uh, camp down there. What's his hair? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, Latrell had Phil Bennett, who's his DC over at UNT. He was there. Um, I'm trying to think of what other collegiate coaches. I know there was a couple TCU guys that were there, but 
man, you got to understand that from a college coach's standpoint, like those guys come to speak and like, we love to hear it. But the other part of that is if you're not out there shaking hands and that kid two years has a three or four star, uh, he, and some other guy was shaking his hand and, you know, talking to him, well, you know, you might've just missed out on that kid that could change your defense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll tell you what, man, I'm writing it down. I'm, I'm coming out there next year. Got to. I mean, hey, I, I'm giving you all that flack. I didn't even get to go. I, I mean, I could have gone, but talking to the wife, it was like, yeah, okay, no. if you go, I'm going into labor. If you stay, you know nothing's going to happen. I was like, I know, so I'm staying. Yeah, exactly. You, you, you're you pushing that line, and also, you know, you can't you can't make mama mad now because you're gone, and then exactly. 10 days later, you got to go again. And that was the, the ultimate choose your battles wisely. Yes, yes. Uh oh, we got we got we got Hollywood in here. JT tempo's not tempo. I hear you, man. What uh, do you do? We're going back. You said you got uh, talking about UNC green light, yellow light, red light. Do you kind of go with that same philosophy, or like what's your? Do you just have to like super fast and then check with me, or uh, what? What's your... In in my mind, we've got three. Um, if we're um. If we're playing, we're just playing. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to call it as I see it. And that's just kind of, I guess, would be like our green. And then our yellow is is more in that 10 to 15 play clock range. Quarterback's got great vision. He can he can see the whole field and the play clock. So he, I got a lot of confidence in him to where we're going to communicate. And as long as we're inside 15, you're good. And then our last one's, you know, four, six-minute offense, whatever you want to call it, we're going to be inside five. And – his control is predicated off of any motions or things of that nature. But those are kind of our three windows of just play 10 to 15 on the play clock, you know, inside five. And there were different times in our, I mean, obviously, you know, you're, you're just play is your just play, but we used the other two pretty often to mix things up in our, in our playoff run last year. I like it. Which one did you work the best? Um, we were able to control and close out games with, uh, with our inside five for sure. I mean, we even, you know, I'm really lucky because our quarterbacks coach is an absolute stud and his OC Keith Heckendorf is like a football genius. He's one of the guys that has watched and prepared for and planned for any type of unique one-off situation things of that nature. And so we actually spent some time during one of our bye weeks working on, you know, not just our six minute offense, but then how to take a knee and everybody's got their sheet, right? One timeout, two timeouts, three timeouts. This is how much time's left. This is how many first downs you have to get. Uh, but we spent a day of one of our bye weeks working on when we're just outside the 140 window, right? So the, the opposing team has no more timeouts, but there's two minutes left or there's like 205 left. So your quarterback's got to be able to take a knee, kill some time, or take a snap, kill some time before he takes a knee so you can get back into the 40-second clock. And we ended up using it in the second round of the playoffs, and he had to – I mean, I, I probably put him in a bad situation. We had to burn 11 seconds. He had to take a snap and burn 11 seconds. And uh, he got he made it just barely. Um, but a lot of that was dictated off of our skill guys being prepared for that just from a bye week practice. What, how did, how did he burn 11 seconds? Was he, did he pull so a Benny we went, Hill? We went like, we went shotgun victory and he caught it and then just kind of took a little mini drop and they knew we were going to take a knee just based out the formation. We're double tight, all that stuff. So they take like one hard step and our O-line's foot to foot. And so they're holding like a brick wall and only one guy really rushes. Well, he drops his shoulder and steps up in the pocket, kind of slides around, and the skill kids are trying to chip and, and work. And so he spins, he kind of spins around back into the pocket and he's wide, staring at the play clock. And right when it got to the uh, right inside of 120, he took a knee. You should do, you should put in a play like that and then just slip someone for a touchdown. Yeah, and then just throw, throw a fade. Yeah. yeah. And then piss everybody off. Yeah. And everything. I freaking love that. All right, I want to get your thought on this because I've, I've thought about this. Coach P says, as a head coach, if I go three and out, then I expect my defense to make the other team go three and out. Everyone says your defense is out there too long. Well, isn't their offense out there that long as well? And I agree because he, here's my thing, right? Defense is always bitch when offenses go three and out. 
But on the flip side, do you ever hear offenses, if they just go on a long, sustained drive, they score, they come to the sideline, they're sitting there, defense goes out, gets a pick, and then the offense has to run right back out there. You never hear offensive guys go, oh, shit, man, we just – can we not get a break and do that? <laughs> Why do you think that is? Um, I think it's the it's I think it's two part. I think it's the immediate defensive personality trait of defensive coaches. <laughs> They're I, I think it's just ingrained in their body. And then the other part of that is is that defense on a serious note, defense is so reactionary that it it takes more energy, it takes more effort. Um, you know, if if we're in a situation where we go on a 12 play drive, they go out, force a fumble and we're right back out there and my running backs tired or my stud receivers tired. Well, I'll just find some different options and the defense has to react to me because they don't necessarily know that. I think about the Denver Broncos play. Can't remember which Super Bowl, but you know, Terrell Davis used to have those really bad migraines and he like couldn't see his vision had gone blurry. Shannon tells him, you're not getting the ball. We just have to go out. You have to go out there. So they believe it. And, you know, we can put ourselves in those situations to take care, care of guys whose legs might be heavy or still winded from the last drive. You know, if that 12 play drive, eight of them were me giving the ball to our running back. Well, I'll either put in a different running back or we're going to throw the ball dink and dunk it a little bit. Um, and so I think that's the other part. Plus, you know, we're, we always want the ball anyway, especially me being a former receiver. I want the ball. So if you can force a turnover and, and I have to play 150 plays, I'm not going to complain. I I agree. And But you said something that I like, that defense is reactionary. Do you feel that a lot of defensive coaches are too back on their heels and react? Because to me, I think, at least at the high school level, again, not, not big time Texas, but in South Carolina – I think defensive coordinators should sack up a little bit and actually bring the funk a little bit more because I know that if my quarterback gets pressured or smacked in the mouth early in the game, he's done for the rest of the game. So the short answer is yes. The The other part of that is our school is built on – its success was built on what's called the 10-1, which is basically a bare front. Yeah. But it's, it's press man free – 90% of the time. So bringing the funk is what our kids know they love and they're used to. So, and I've seen our ability to kind of hide flaws, whether it be a, a lack of like absolute stud athletes or, you know, mismatches being able to hide that through pressure. So just from firsthand experience, seeing our guys, you know, but you have to accept the fact, especially as the offensive side that, you know, there may be a couple of times where, they do that and they throw up that go ball and that kid goes and wins and, you know, they score a 60 yard touchdown, but yeah. that's just part of it. I, I, I completely agree. And to me, I think I, I love the 10 one. Like when I stumbled upon that, I, I went, that makes so much sense. Why aren't more people doing that? Because you, I mean, you're mauling kids and kids, they don't get that because for me, and I know a lot of people, defensive coaches always complain about seven on seven. Football's turning into seven on seven. Blah, blah, blah. Well, use that to your advantage because I know at the wide receiver, the kids I got, if you get mashed at the line of scrimmage, they kind of just give up. And we're trying to change that. But if I know that's what's going to happen, I'm going to get in your face and make you my, my, my woman and just destroy you at the line of scrimmage because then that helps me. I just don't, I think defensive coordinators play too soft. And it makes it makes our kids so much better because yeah. they're used to whether it's scout because our our sub varsity is going to look just like our varsity from a defensive alignment standpoint. So our scout team, when we enter squad, when we do good versus good during team, any of that, you're going to get pressed, and they're going to try and get hands in your chest. And one of the kind of running themes of our off season this year with me and the receivers has been, you know, one on one press man is disrespectful. And if you're willing to accept that level of disrespect, then we can't throw you the ball. So either beat it or find a different position because that has to be our mentality because of how much we see it, not just in practice, but the majority of the teams on our, on our schedule are going to play press man, cover one, you know, two man or zero. I agree. And this is also the thing that I, I'm going to equate this to ba basketball. Cause I grew up in basketball my whole life. Um, 
bringing the funk press man to me is like those teams that run and run and jump you the entire 90 minutes of hell Mm -hmm. where they're going to double team you whenever they're going to go everywhere. And that changes your whole philosophy offensively because now you're playing to what the defense is doing instead of making the defense play to what you're doing. And I just think it makes sense. You you can get aggressive kids. And for Coach B, he doesn't know what what is the 10-1. Could you just so the 10-1 is it originated from a Salina standpoint, it originated back in the the 90s. There was this transition, GA Moore. They win their first day, they win their first state championship in the 70s. But then with the big run that happened, they win one in 95. And GA Moore, Butch Ford built this defense that's kind of foundationally tailored around a bare front. But you've got essentially when the reason it was called a 10 1 is because you've got 10 guys on the line of scrimmage <laughs> and you've got one guy deep. Now, our version is right now, we're going to have, depending on the formation, we're going to have five to seven guys in the box on the line of scrimmage. And then you're going to have a Mike linebacker at about two and a half, three yards. And it just, it, it creates so much of it is pre snap panic from the offense. (laughs) Yes. Because we, there's a couple other schools that do a variation of it. um, But the majority of guys, we're the only time they see it. And talking to other coaches that have been on our schedule, seeing uh, the times where, you know, they tell us uh, we we have a bye week before we play y'all, and that week is ten one week because it's so different. Yeah, and it's uh, seriously, guys, if you haven't seen it, I have no idea how the hell I just switched switched us from <laughs> left to right. I have <laughs> no idea. <laughs> if you go and look on YouTube, ten one, it's unbelievable. It's it. It makes the defense crap their pants. I mean, the offense crap their pants. Like, everybody on the offensive side gets that tight butthole. I know the offensive coordinator's like, crap, what do we do now? Because normally what we're doing, we can't we can't do that, so we have to switch it up, and it's something new. I freaking love that. Uh, Edward says, I finally I actually got my head coaching job because I brought the funk as a DC. I'd rather lose bringing eight than dropping eight. Preach. I, Preach. I agree. I agree. I spent yeah. my I spent my entire fifth grade year in Gage Eight all day, <laughs> so I get it. I love it. I I do the same thing in Madden, man. I'm just like That's it. yellow. Bring the bring the font. Johnny says uh, easier to scheme up more pressure than it is to scheme better coverage. I agree, and, and to me, this is the thing. I'm dumb. I'm smart yeah. enough to know I'm dumb. Okay. I still, for the life of me, do not understand Rip Liz, do not understand the intricate details of match coverage, all of that shit. Pardon my French, because when I go and look, like, you're putting in all this exotic defenses, and I get it at the college level. I do. They do a lot more stuff. But in high school, I can go back, and I can look at every single game that we played against our opponent. Maybe one team threw four verts four times. And if that, if you go back and look, they're just that quarterback is locking on their guy playing as JT says, bro ball. So why do you need to have the match coverage and the rules and the run and shoot for defense where I can just bring the funk country cover three and I can create havoc at the high school level. I, I don't that I'm getting off my soapbox. I'm just taking that out. I, I will say that at, not really at our level, but at the big school level, you know, six, a schools are running, 2,500 students through their hallways and there's, you know, 150 of them in the state. And you look at the South Lakes, the Allens, the Austin West Lake, you got these coach Chad Morris, Todd Dodge, Riley Dodge, like these guys have been entrenched in highly successful, highly efficient offensive football that I remember a couple of years ago. Um, and the flip side of that is, you know, they're playing a school that's got 2000 kids and three or four of them are probably division one prospects. And if three of them play on the defensive side of the ball, I was listening to the long view defensive coordinator a few years ago, uh, talk about a lot of their different coverages and how they spin and how they'll work from, you know, two high to one high and why they're doing it and what these guys are looking at. And about two minutes into his, his talk, he just stopped and he said, now I understand you know, we were able to do this because of the kids we have. He's headed here. He's headed here. He's headed there. And I just kind of quietly closed my portfolio and was like, well, we don't play any of those guys. So I'm just going to listen and be in awe. 
And I think that's a big part of it is that if you have the ability, if you're not a split practice like we are, if you're a big school and you've got Division One talent, like deep Division One talent, then your ability to freelance and do some of those things, it creates opportunities and problems that you can use the regular season to hone in for that third, fourth, fifth round opponent. And that's why a lot of I think a lot of guys at the bigger school level do it here. But if you're trying to do all that stuff at a school that has a split practice, son, you must be a dang good coach. I I agree. And I'm going to be honest. Look, I, I can't look into the future because if I did, my ass would have been up in space with Jeff uh, Bezos because I would have put all my money in his stock and that's now like $8,000. I want simple things because I don't know if I'm going to go deep in the playoffs because I don't know if my quarterback, and this has happened before, is going to light himself on fire one night because he got drunk. No shit. My, the first time um, we in my old school made it to the playoffs for the first time in five years, we had a, we had a break. It was when we got a lot of hurricanes, so we had to buy because everyone had to play catch up. He got drunk one night, and his buddy lit him on fire, second-degree burns all the way to his back. So I had to start a wide receiver that's never played quarterback before in the first round of the playoffs. Now, I can't see that. So I want to be good now. And to me, it just seems like defensively, and I'm going to catch a lot of flack from this because I'm a simpleton. Bring the funk, play sound, like just bring the funk. I, and just you win, you'll win a lot more games than you lose if you bring pressure and eliminate inside routes. That's that's it. <laughs> make 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 homie throw the fade. You know, make them throw it, and if they complete one out of ten, I know the thing is offensively like, oh, we only got to complete one pass like that, and they're going to back off. Make me complete two or three, because I promise you that guy can't. He got lucky. I've seen him in practice. Like I'm like, please don't make me throw that ball. Give me this little thing right here. I just, I think defense is making it a little bit harder than they should, and this is coming from a defensive guy. Like, I played defense my entire life. I was too slow to play offense in high school and college. And I just I'm not fast like you, man. I'm not I'm not a burner. I was a I was a B gap to B gap middle linebacker. And the only reason why I could actually do something was I studied the game. Like I could tell the little things like, oh, that fat guy is not fully on his on his fingers. He must be pulling. Okay, that gives me a little bit of advantage because if you test my 40, uh, you got to get a sundial because I'm gonna be here all day. <laughs> but an, enough of defense. Piss on them. <laughs> Um, during COVID, I want to know your thing. How did you not implement everything that you learned from Zuma Palooza, or did you? And then after when the season was going, you had to reel back, be like, "Man, we really don't need that." Um, we zoomed with our kids a lot. Um, when we did the screen share and things of that nature, I actually was able to swindle the social studies department at the high school to buy me a, a screen recording membership. And so I could do, we did like all the, we went through all of our, we did a virtual install schedule. Then we did like conditioning camp install schedule and we got to go back in July. And then we did a two a day install schedule. So we used a ton of it and you know, the individual meetings the position meetings, all that stuff. The one thing that stuck was the Google form quizzes that position coaches would make. And then those screen recordings continued because it eliminated the need to meet Monday before practice. Nice. So I could make whatever the scout the scouting report was, whatever any of those things were, the the offensive staff could com, kind of complete all that, and then I could go through the game plan, and it would be something that we had talked about at the office. But once we've kind of once I've kind of finite the the list and whatnot, record those expectations. Here's who they are. Here's what we're gonna do that's different. Here's how we're going to attack. Here's the new stuff. And I could make a 15 to 20 minute video. Now I had the ability to record up to like an hour. I tried not to because, you know, they say, it's, you know, a kid's attention spans like half his age or whatever. So I knew I only had like eight minutes. So record that video, give them an idea and then attach a Google quiz, Google form quiz to the end of it, make them answer a question. And that just shows me there's like, they went through the video, right? They, they had to turn some in. That's a little check mark. Um, that was the biggest thing that I took away from it because the kids picked up on all the zoom stuff and they, you know, now they're not getting like 
printed packets and whatnot and they don't have to go on and log on to huddle and like try and click through all these slides and whatnot they can just use google classroom like they do for all their actual classes uh so the transition was really easy but we tried really hard not to overload them with too much are you still using the google classrooms and stuff oh. like that in the summer is that something will, like that's for me that's a staple um nice. just because it's it's the easiest form of communication. Yeah. The kids, they get a Google email address from the school. They have Google uh, Classroom uploaded on their school issue iPads. And so a lot of, you know, teachers would get frustrated and be like, well, why would we, why should we unblock the Huddle app? He, he's in class. He doesn't need to be streaming. It's like, okay, so we can kind of go. There's a workaround there. I'll just screen record and put it in Google Classroom. He's just on Google Classroom. Yeah, yeah. So, but it, it works take really easy. It's new how. What's up? I said, take that, Karen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing, man. I, I don't, I don't, I hate teachers that shit on football when the moment a football kid acts up in class, it doesn't even matter if it's football season. He could be knee deep in track. But she's going to turn around, and usually it's a she. I know that's a little sexist, but and finds a football coach and complains. It's like, no, 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 no. Hey, remember when you were talking crap about how we wanted the huddle app? Yeah, go to the track coach. I know exactly. most track coaches are football coaches, but get out of my face. I, I, I don't want to see you. I, I hate that. I love it. I hate it. It's like, oh, I've gotten in trouble with that before. I'm like, hey, it's not football season, you know? Shut the hell up. Get out of my face. Let me, let me watch some huddle. Like you have a classroom management problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't, I've got 40 of them in a math class. I, he doesn't seem to really bother me, but he comes in here and he farts one time, and then you're writing them up and, and, and turning them into coach. Get out of here, woman. I know your kids, Karen. They're awful. <laughs> you can't handle your kids. How, what makes you think you can handle this one? I'm sorry. I didn't mean yeah, that. You've been on a couple different soapboxes tonight. I, I have, that. man. You just bring it out of me because I want you to bring out the DC. But here's the thing, man. I want to know. Tell me about your podcast. That thing is amazing. So the quick six is, you know, last last quarantine jumped into the the world the worldwide YouTube love and and did some stuff on there. But uh, talked to my buddy Trenton Kirkland who we met when we G8 at Tarleton. He was a Texas high school football coach, got an opportunity to go up to Nashville and um, be the OC for Trent Dilfer for a couple of years. Um, but he moved back and we had kind of talked about doing something. I'd let him know that I wanted to start a podcast. So when he got back, he's, he's relatively in the area. I asked him, Hey, would you be interested in doing this? And we, we talk football, but we don't, it's not X's and O's. We're not concept driven. Um, it's kind of the everything else, right? Like the off the field, building great men, telling stories about experiences. Uh, and every once in a while, you know, we might jump into an accidental like Y cross scenario and, and break down where a safety's feet were, but we don't mean to. Um, and we will have people on and just kind of talk about what's going on in the game, what people are, are dealing with experiencing, uh, the highs and lows. And, um, the biggest reason is I think that the the platform of football, it's really easy for us to lose the purpose, right? Uh, I just read something uh, earlier this or last week that talked about a lot of people are convinced or are convincing their kids that the purpose of, of high school sports is to earn an athletic scholarship. And it's not, it's about doing something hard and, and being trained to deal with adversity and, work with others and unselfishness and all these, uh, all these character traits that are so invaluable for life after sports, life after high school. Um, and so kind of trying to keep the main thing, the main thing and remind people listening, coaches, whoever it is that, you know, Hey, we're people too. We have highs and lows. We got these weird experiences, but we're doing this because we want to build better leaders. You know, we've talked about different books, We've talked about, you know, different meetings that he's had or I've had, you know, good stories, bad stories. And it's just a place for us to to kind of reconnect with coaches, not in front of a whiteboard. I like that. And uh, coaches, if you want, look in the description. There's a link to it. It's really good. You mentioned books. I'm always on the lookout for a book. What's the the last book you read that you're like, oh, this is really good? So I just finished um, a couple of weeks. I said just a couple of weeks ago, I finished John Gordon's training camp. Um, which is a super easy read, um, but it's a great story. 
you know, John Gordon's awesome at writing those shorter inspirational fictional stories that are never read one of his stuff, man. Oh my gosh. The energy bus training camp. These are how to, uh, I think he's got one. It's called how to be an effective leader. Uh, I think is the title, but the training camp was absolutely awesome. Uh, currently right now reading uncomfortable conversations with a black man by Emmanuel Acho. Uh, that's the book that our book club has picked. So, uh, finishing that one up, but I would say the most entertaining story I've read as of recent is, um, the greatest beer run, uh, in his, I think it's called the greatest beer run ever or in history. Um, it's about this guy from uh, the Bronx who, had done a couple tours. He was out of the military um, and gets convinced by the neighborhood to sneak onto a ship and go to Vietnam and takes the neighborhood boys a, a beer and just say, we love you. We're thinking of you. And it's a true story, which is the craziest part. I see he, it. he goes over there and um, is running around trying to dodge bullets in Vietnam and say hi to his buddies. And it's a, it's a really good story, and it's actually, I think they're in talks of making it into a movie. Yeah, it says it, it is. I, I'm going to put this on. I'm looking for one. I read, the last one I just read was Make Your Bed. I, uh, I can't remember what who was. I'm awful at that. <laughs> All right, Colonel uh, William McRaven. Talking oh, about he gave the, the UT commencement space. Yeah, so yeah. I, that. I got you. you want I to just read that. By making Your Bed. I'm going to be honest. Great book. I'm not making my bed. Right? <laughs> great principle. Not I, in theory, love it. Uh, when I usually wake up, my son is still asleep in the bed beside me. And then um, I can't just be like, hey, buddy, smack him in the head. Time to get up. I got to make my bed. But I, I, can see, I, I like the concept. I made that an offseason challenge for the quarterbacks a couple years ago when I was coaching them that uh, I said, I got all of your parents' numbers. And on any given morning, I can text them and ask if they if you made your bed and if they say no then you have punishment and how, how long did that did that last we made it the whole semester and only one kid had it happen but i had a, I had a couple of moms and a dad stop me and be like you have no idea like he doesn't understand it but like there were certain idiosyncrasies that changed because he got into that routine where he had to get up and make his bed so nice but also i'm also the mean coach that like i made my kids do like I made the quarterbacks do like book reports in the off season. Nerd, man. Nerd. <laughs> oh my goodness. I like that. What, what was the last, what was one of the book reports that you made them do that really like affected the kids with the book? Um, I had them read playing for pizza by John Grisham, uh, which is about the Italian American football league. Um, that was the book that kind of got the, the biggest overall, like, man, this book, this was a good story, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we read the, uh, what was it? I can't think of it. It's the Tony Dungy book. Um, and a lot of them fudged their book reports, but there was a couple kids that actually read it and I feel like they might've gotten something out of it. Uh, the leadership one, mm -hmm. did they get it from Wikipedia? Probably. I mean, you can tell when like you, I mean, they're pretty <laughs> simple and like questions to answer and like they're all verbatim ex copy and pasted the same. I'm like, you guys know that there's only five of these and I read them. Yeah. Oh, I like that, man. So heck yeah, I might have, I'm going to steal that. What's this book club that you're talking about? Uh, it's a couple of guys from college. We, uh, you know, we started one of them during COVID or I guess before COVID in 2019 uh, said, Hey, would you be interested in starting a book club? And uh, we just take turns. We pick a book and then take, you know, three to five weeks and read it. And then we hop on a zoom or, you know, try and once a year meet up in person, talk about it, spend a weekend just hanging out. But it's just another way for us to kind of push each other, grow, you know, you're going to read a book that some other guy picked that, you know, may not be the book you picked. Like right now reading the Emmanuel Acho uncomfortable conversations of the black man. Would I read it? I don't know, but I am right now. And there's, you know, there's been some chapters that have been, really good kind of progressive make you think a little bit there's some been some redundancies that you know the hard part about a book like this is that it's a one-sided conversation you can't you know you can't see him be like hey why did you you know yeah. but um it's just another way for us to kind of to grow as men and you know all of us are kind of moving into that fatherhood phase at the same time so and then hit that 
I can't wait till someone gets the book with like the uh, midlife crisis, <laughs> like, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> existential crisis. What are we doing here? All that. Be like, hey, buddy, a little too deep. Let's 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 not give everybody that sense of dread. I love it, man. Well, I, I appreciate you coming on. I try to get DC out of him, guys, but he would not listen. Um, is there anything else you want to say to the coaches that are here before we get out? No, man. Um, I I appreciate you. You know, you're you're the football YouTube god. So I, I'm uh, JT's in the comments. I'm I'm just thankful to to be asked to be on here. And um, if you guys would check out the quick six, uh, give us a give us a listen. Let us know what you think. We are, everybody's being super, we're in the like Cinderella phase right now. Everybody's being super nice. So if you have any critiques or criticisms, keep it to yourself. Us, keep it you to yourself. <laughs> don't say, listen, I learned this from Bambi. If you don't have anything nice to say, shut the hell up. Okay. <laughs> don't do that. I'm just kidding, guys. It, it's great. There's nothing. The reason why you're getting all this praise is because it is freaking amazing. And coaches, if you want to go into the description, there's a link. Click it, subscribe, give it five stars on iTunes, and listen to everything. You'll get so much out of it. I freaking love it. Travis, man, I appreciate you coming on, dude. Oh, I appreciate you having me. Thanks, man. All right, and coaches, I will see you later. Let me do that. Boom. Y'all have a good one.